Hello, um, welcome all. Welcome to uh, the uh, seminar uh, hosted by the Caribbean Studies Network here at the University of Oxford and uh, part of the Oxford Research Centre in Humanities. Um, delighted to have uh, four uh, discussant speakers today, uh, Yana Lagro, uh, Beth Manley, Raj Chetty and Eddie Paulino. Um, and they will be discussing their current research and, and future trends really within uh, historical uh, and historiographies of the uh, Dominican Republic, Haiti and the island as a whole. So it's an informal, um, like I say, round, not round table, it's square screen discussion. Um, we'll have a couple of questions to each of our speakers uh, and then really open to the audience. Um, so uh, there's a Q&A um, for you to scribble any questions you have in to collectively to all speakers about your, your views on, on the future and current research on the island or about the island or around the island um, and we have an open house really so uh, we're encouraging discussants to intervene and, and, and chat and we'll have the next 60 minutes uh, of uh, discussion debate about the, the state of historical studies um, well in the Dominican Republic Haiti and, and, and Pan-Caribbean as well if that comes into discussion. So I'll briefly introduce our four discussants and then they will get to talk about their own research and uh, future ideas research. So um, first off we'll have Ayana Lugro. She is uh, currently studying for a PhD at Duke University. She's an interdisciplinary historian um, and she focuses on sound studies, immigration, black diaspora studies and history of technology. Uh, then we have um, Beth Manley at Xavier University. Her research has uh, focused on, on the island, Dominican Republic, uh, Haiti, and I think more recently in Jamaica and elsewhere. Um, but her work looks at gender and participation in politics, nationalism, revolution, and political, political change. And she's published a book called The Paradox of Paternalism, Women and Authoritarianism in the Dominican Republic. And then we have Raj Chetty from St. John's University. Raj's research focuses on world uh, literatures in English, and it particularly specializes on uh, French, English, Spanish, French language uh, literary texts across the Caribbean. And Eddie Paulino is joining us. Uh, he's at John Jay College, uh, City University of New York, and uh, Eddie's work has uh, focused on race, genocide, uh, borders and nation building, and he published uh, Dividing Hispaniola, the Dominican Republic's border campaign against Haiti, 1930 to 1961. So I'm delighted to have uh, four researchers joining us today. Um, and we'll, 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 we'll start straight off and just encourage them to talk about their current research uh, uh, in, in the opening question, and just to give some idea of what's inspired them in terms of uh, the current research they're pursuing or even previous projects. So Ayana, um, over to you. Uh, I just wonder if you could say something about your current research and again, what's inspired you to focus on this topic? Absolutely. Um, thank you again. It's wonderful to be here. Um, I, uh, I grew up in New York City. Um, I'm the daughter of two uh, Haitian migrants. Um, and my work and interest in Haiti, um, like many in the diaspora, um, really catapulted after the earthquake in 2010, um, because I was really just, just trying to figure out um, how ideas about Haiti were formulated. Um, and at that time, I was also interested in researching um, Black identity and history in Colombia. Um, and um, my first job actually out of college was um, <laughs> with uh, MUDA, Movimiento de Mujeres um, Dominicano Haitiano in, um, in uh, the Dominican Republic. Um, and I went over uh, with a colleague um, and uh, lived um, and worked in a bate um, and took the bus over the border thinking that I was ready to be an aid worker um, or potentially wanted to do foreign policy or something. I was still trying to figure things out. Um, but I was so horrified by the state of Port-au-Prince um, and I was confused about um, the architecture. I was confused about the pollution. Um, I was hurt by the homelessness. Um, and I said, if this is what aid is about, I don't want any part in this. Um, 
I need to figure out what it is that I really want to do. Um, so at that time, I moved back to New York and dabbled around in teaching settings um, in various institutions um, and did some arts programming, um, educational programming while I was doing my master's. Um, and about right before I was supposed to move and start the PhD process, um, I had started to slowly interview uh, members of the Haitian community in New York um, and um, came to certain conversations with my father, um, my mother, um, extended relatives about um, Haitian activism. Um, and uh, at that point, it reignited a discussion in my family about um, a radio station that my father, a radio program, excuse me, that my father had uh, started in 1969 um, with some folks um, at Columbia University. Um, I was really, I became very curious about radio um, and the ways in which it um, serves uh, a, a strong presence in migrant communities um, and the ways in which it, um, became a, a space for Haitians that were living in New York to, you know, engage with people that were in Canada, Miami, France to discuss politics, but also became become a, basically a space for social services um, during the, the, the refugee crisis. And, um, you know, so much so that people could call into the station trying to find, you know, a cousin um, or reconnect with a loved one um, you know, or, or figure out what was going on in detention centers, um, like Guantanamo Bay. Um, and so I, I myself, um, though I am in a history program and my thought, you know, coming in was that, you know, real historians like read paper documents, you know, and I, you know, it, it was, I was just trying to sit here and, and kind of grapple with like, well, what is sound? What does sound mean for people? Um, and how do people coming from traditionally oral societies, um, you know, really tell stories and, and use technology like radio in order to um, in order to express and live their lives and thoughts about um, freedom and a new society. Um, so I'll pause there and uh, pass the mic to Beth. Thanks very much. Yes, Beth, so over to you uh, in New Orleans. Um, can you say something about your, your current research and you know, your inspirations really for, for following this path? Yeah, thanks again. Um, I wanna echo Ayana's comments and a pleasure to be here and to get to have this conversation with y'all. Um, you know, it's a strange world, but one in which I'm grateful to kind of take ben, take from what we can, the benefits of, of where we're at. Um, I began my work in, in the Dominican Republic in the early 2000s, um, and I had absolutely no connection uh, to the island, to the country. I didn't exactly know what I was stepping into at all, um, but I knew that I wanted to do historical research and I'd become fascinated with the island as an undergraduate. Um, through some, you know, fabulous instructors that just had drawn my attention to the place. And, um, and so I, I kind of started to do some archival research and became fascinated by what seemed to me to be sort of a paradox of contemporary politics in which you saw women at high levels, or at least in comparison to the US, a lot higher levels in the political structure um, and yet some very traditional ideas about maternalism and paternalism within um, everyday quotidian social structures. And for me, that really kind of evolved into a question of how the authoritarian regimes of Joaquin Balaguer and Rafael Trujillo had engaged with women and gender over the course of nearly 50 years of authoritarian leadership. And I, I spent the next 10, 15 years sort of digging into that question first in my um, PhD dissertation and then later in the book that um, was published a couple of years ago, The Paradox of Paternalism. Um, and I think 
for me, it was really, really important to kind of try to understand the ways in which women had become engaged in the political process. I mean, one of the first things that I found in my archival searching, I was looking into this um, this nonprofit, and Ayanna, I, I echo your thoughts about right aid work. I was looking into this organization called Care that was trying to provide school lunches in the '60s, um, and and one of the most fascinating things that I found were these mothers writing from small towns in the middle of the country saying, "We know that this program is here." Um, why isn't that at, at our school? Why aren't our children a, a part of this, right? And that level of political awareness, both to kind of be aware of what was going on and, th and that this program was happening in other places, but to know how to write to the government and to government officials to say, we are deserving of this also, right, um, was really compelling to me. And so I wanted to to understand and to dig deeper into the ways in which women became part of the political process from sort of the beginnings of the 20th century. And, and that story has really, really deep roots that I think we still are working to fully uncover um, and, and trying to understand even going back to the occupation and, and the ways in which women were crucial in pushing back against US military occupation in the early part of the 20th century and, and through the dictatorships. Um, and I've remained focused that that question is still, right, where we find women in the archives and, and the ways in which we can tell their stories that haven't been told before remains a really important question to me. But my my the project I'm working on now developed out of some kind of tangential questions that I had while I was doing my research for the first book. Um, I became both fascinated and, and somewhat disgusted by the practice of sex tourism and particularly um, women's sex tourism, women that traveled to the island um, specifically or sort of accidentally, if you will, for liaisons with local men. Um, and I was sort of wanting to understand what it was that made the island and ultimately the entire region a place in which this was a possibility, right? That Global North women could see this as a space of possibility for their, you know, romantic, if you will, liaisons. Um, and so I started to kind of think about that on the side and it wasn't until, you know, after the first book came out that I was able to say, is this, you know, sort of worth looking into, is this a project that I that I can engage with? And for me, what it did, it gave me the opportunity to think across a pan, at, at a kind of pan-Caribbean level. Because one of the things I realized as I was thinking through this practice of women's sex tourism is that it, it repeats itself across the islands and in very similar ways, right? If you look at Jamaica, if you uh, look at um, the Bahamas, if you look at in Haiti, you see similar tropes of the men that are part of this economy and, and the way in which they present quote unquote services, right, as well as the women and their expectations as they travel. And I wanted to understand that better, but I was certainly not an anthropologist or a sociologist by that point. I'd been very well trained as an art, you know, archival historian. And so I went back to the kind of methods of my first project, which is to say, let's look at the roots of this. Um, and Mimi Scheller's Consuming the Caribbean was a major touchstone for me in this. And the way that her kind of work in mobility studies, not just in that book, but in, in all of her work um, was, was a really important way to start framing this and to think across the Caribbean, which I think is an important trend that all of our work does here, right? Across borders, across linguistic barriers. Um, and the fact that the Caribbean has always been this place of, of flux and movement. And so those kinds of ideas about mobility studies really resonate in the Caribbean. Um, but when I started looking into tourism, what I found is while there was a lot of work in literary studies and and anthropology and sociology, uh, the work that is pan-Caribbean on tourism historically is fairly limited. And I really wanted to kind of dig into that and still remain attentive to that original question about women's sex tourism. And so I started digging in the archives 
um, simply looking for women, gender, and tourism, and trying to figure out sort of what was coming up. And what I started finding um, in the Dominican Republic, in Puerto Rico, in Jamaica, um, is that women were major protagonists. They weren't the heads of the ministries of tourism, but they were everywhere else across this story of tourism development. And specifically in the process of creating the Caribbean as this kind of Edenic fantasy place of escape, which I think is crucial in that question of how Global North women can envision this a place of consumption, right? And so what this new project is, is trying to do, it's, it's tentatively titled Imagining the Tropics, is to look across the entire region and not just find women in the production of tourism, both Global North and Caribbean women, but to understand the ways in which gender and race are imbricated in the process of constructing that image of Carib of, of fantasy vacation, right? That allows for not just the kinds of consumption of sex tourism, but all other, all sorts of other kinds of consumption um, that, that help us understand the very extractive nature of this industry. And I think it pulls, it is an industry, we understand it as, as pan-Caribbean, but we don't always interrogate it as such. And I think this gives the opportunity to do this in a, in a small way to kind of make those linkages and to think about the issues of, of race and sex and gender kind of in interconnected ways. So that's what I'm working on now. And I'm excited to hear what the rest of y'all are working on. Thanks very much, Beth. Um, Raj, over to you about your current or previous research and inspirations, I think. So over to you, I think, in Long Island, probably. Yes. Yeah, yeah, Maybe. from my home in Long Island. And um, again, grateful thanks to Torch, David, for the invitation. And it's great to be with all of you as friends and colleagues in some sort of same field. This is a really wonderful opportunity. Um, so uh, so maybe I'll start with, I, I tell this anecdote sometimes about how, how I ended up thinking about what I focus on in terms of the Dominican Republic on race and blackness specifically um, as sort of like the line of inquiry, like what is blackness and how is it working? Um, uh, who is black? These sort of questions around uh, or taking blackness as the, as, the, as the source of the inquiry rather than sort of a given. Um, and, and it started, I was, I was doing my PhD at the University of Washington and I was at this panel and I can't remember when I was, this was prior to even writing my dissertation. Maybe I had a prospectus going, um, but it was a panel on baseball. And um, it was fascinating because um, I, I can't, again, I, I don't remember who was speaking, but there was a discussion um, that repeats about every year right around Jackie Robinson, the celebration of the, you know, the so-called breaking of the color barrier in baseball. Um, and the, the, the conversation that always seems to happen uh, right at that time is the decline of the black baseball player. And black means something very particular in that phrasing. It doesn't mean uh, Afro-Latinos, it doesn't mean Dominicans, it means the African-American baseball player. And so the decline that they're tracking, for me was interesting that there was sort of a segmenting or a, sort of a, a, an ethnicizing of Dominicans out of racial blackness towards Latinidad um, and a sort of a, a shoring up of blackness as being sort of a very particular US uh, uh, sort of identity, sort of African-American identity. And not cleanly, but there was a sort of, a sort of um, something of a line between what might be called um, a black American and a black immigrant or black Dominican uh, uh, sort of experience. And so this case came out of baseball and I'm a baseball fan and I was like, oh, this was good. So, so, so it wasn't, I didn't, I didn't approach it as, oh, they're wrong because Dominicans really are black. Um, uh, or it, it, wasn't, it wasn't coming from the sort of, it was kind of like, what is going on with this sort of, what's, what's behind these moves um, to sort of narrate blackness in these kinds of ways and particularly in the social field, this cultural field of, of baseball. Um, and so, you know, that, that was sort of the initial sort of where, where I initial, initially started hearing this question. Um, and, then, and then in digging into your own work, David, and other people's work, sort of the, and, and Silvio Torres Ayan in particular, sort of been talking about these things. And then the, the sort of the, the spate of articles that were really about, well, Dominicans hate themselves, they're negrophobic and they hate Haitians and it was all one and the same thing. And that's sort of the, the drumbeat of that kind of negrophobia, anti-blackness that all Dominicans suffer from. Um, uh, was 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 it was it was it was a troubling thing, and especially because I was thinking from baseball, I was like, all the baseball players I know in the Dominican Republic, or sort of from the Dominican Republic, are uh, very dark skinned and I can't imagine that they don't know they're black or that they didn't know they were black. Whatever they might say of themselves, um, the, the experiences they would have had, 
in like what Ayana describing in Bateyes, in other sort of impoverished communities and other sort of racialized as black communities in the Dominican Republic, I wondered about where their sort of narratives around blackness were disappearing to. Or what would it mean to see or recognize? Um, again, I was just thinking about baseball players but then I started to think this question a little more broadly. Um, so in the book I'm working on that I've been working on too long that I didn't finish, um, it's, 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 the title is Of Refusal and Recognition. And it's a phrase I've actually borrowed from Stuart Hall, um, his essay on cultural identity and diaspora. It's just a beautiful, remarkable essay that continues to be so generative for so many of us in Caribbean studies. Um, uh, but he has a phrase in there and he's sort of talking about the relationship to sort of blackness across, you know, Caribbean people and, and particularly Anglophone, but and particularly Jamaican, but uh, sort of black diasporic uh, identity projects as cultural projects. Um, and that phrase was so interesting to me because it seemed to capture to me one of the central questions that's happening with Dominicans and their own sort of relationships to blackness both the refusal and a recognition and these politics of what does it mean to think of refusal in a context of global white supremacy, global anti-blackness in an imperial context and in a context in which, and what we're talking about sort of relationships to Haiti, but also to the United States and how blackness and distancing from blackness um, can, can afford again, unfortunately, and perhaps very tragically afford certain kind of um, advantages or certain kind of access to things that um, embracing blackness does not. Um, or recognizing or self-recognizing. So, so that phrase was really useful to me. Again, it was like, a, I don't know, like third or fourth reading of Stuart Hall's essay. And I was like, this is, this is the title of my book, of Refusal and Recognition. Um, and then the subtitle is to look at sort of um, how there are disparate blacknesses that, we, that can emerge um, if we have a different sort of lens of recognition through Dominican literary and expressive cultures in particular. So, so the book it goes from, so a poetry from the Trujillo era, Aida Cartagena Puerta Latin, Carmen Natalia Bonilla, uh, two people that, uh, Bonilla Martinez, two people that, that Beth writes about in, in, in her work and other people have written about, especially in sort of gendered issues um, and women's issues and sort of uh, uh, um, uh, feminist sort of scholarship. Um, but I'm trying to look at sort of, and, and, and I still have to think this question, what does it mean that I'm thinking through how women are, are approaching obliquely um, and perhaps unrecognizably these questions of racial blackness in the Dominican Republic. Um, and, and there is a sort of, to use one example, Aida Cartagena Puerta Latin, for example, um, there's a narrative that tracks her writing from the 1940s when she's writing with sort of within surrealist and surrealist influence networks like Andre Beton and, and the Césaires in Martinique and René Menil. Um, and, and, and she's in France and she's meeting uh, sort of luminaries of these periods. Uh, and she's a Dominican woman and she's a, she's a famous Dominican poet. Like she's not I mean, a Latin American poet, she's, she's well known. Um, but there's this, this tendency to read her writing on race as evolving towards black recognition. Um, and it's one that I really resist because what she's doing in those early moments is writing it under a cover. Um, writing it in a way that is unrecognizable, perhaps for very obvious reasons under Trujillo. But on some level, I think she retains that kind of, and Dominicans more broadly, retain a kind of playful and humorous and ironic and often evasive and indirect relationship to Blackness that gets read as denial. And I'm like, there's something else going on here. So that's what the book is trying to track across. So I'm looking at baseball, a film like Sugar, I think does it beautifully. Um, if people have seen this baseball movie, it tracks a, a minor league player that makes it to the United States, but never makes it. Um, and not once does he say soy negro. But there's so much richness in there in understanding his lived experience as a black Dominican who immigrates to the United States and experiences blackness and immigrantness that I think sort of we lose sight of when we're like, but, but I'm gonna wait till he says soy negro before I accept that this guy understands he's black. And I'm like, there's something else that we're all missing on when, when that's the sort of paradigm we're operating from. Um, so that's that's my sort of major work on Dominican studies. I'm looking at there's a little bit I'm doing on, with C.L.R. James that I'm still it's on the sort of back burner and, and his Haitian revolutionary plays, um, and that's my other sort of uh, other identity dissertation split into two projects. But this has been the one that I've focused on right now. So maybe I can talk about that a little later. Great, thank you very much indeed, Raj. Um, Eddie, over to you. Okay. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, David, for the generous invitation uh, to be part of this esteemed colleagues. Uh, I've been learning so much this morning. Um, and David, your continued solidarity, uh, because uh, I still remember you inviting me to give a talk at Oxford a few years ago, which helped me fulfill one of my bucket lists, which was drink a pint at the Oxford Union bar. So they have a bar in the Oxford Union. And uh, thank you for that. Um, um, so I, I want to contextualize 
how I came to study what I study and what I'm currently studying by singing uh, very quickly one line of a very famous song. Uh, I don't know if you guys remember, especially in the UK. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, Camellia. You come and go. You come and go. This is what I grew up with, right? If you know this song, unlike my daughter who can Spotify it, you grew up, you grew up in real time when the 80s, Culture Club, right? This was my decade. I was born in 69, grew up in the 70s and 80s, right? Culture Club, that's right, Boy George. And what was happening as I was growing up in the projects in public housing in New York City was on PBS, which is like the equivalent of BBC, there was the beginning of this series of awareness of documentaries on genocide and historical kind of the Ken Burns-ish documentaries that focus on historical events, uh, World War I, you know, Neil Ferguson now is associated with that more recently, but it also touched upon genocide. And this was one of the first moments that I remember aside also from reading the first book on genocide, I think in the sixth grade, seventh grade by Milton Metzger called The Holocaust, which I was like, what the hell is this? You know, how can people kill other people en masse, right? Very naive, but I was young, right? And I was asking myself this question in a context where violence in my neighborhood and in New York City, in the crack epidemic was ubiquitous, right? So that, that is informing me growing up in, you know, elementary school, junior high school, high school. I get to college, and I've written about this before. I go to the FDR library, and Beth mentioned this in terms of being trained as an archival historian. I arrive at the FDR presidential library, and I find uh, the archival letter, a diplomatic communique by the U.S. ambassador in the Dominican Republic, uh, Norweb, to his boss in Washington, D.C., Secretary of State Cordell Hull, which, like his counterpart years earlier in Constantinople, Ambassador Morgenthau, that, you know, writes about this, the portent of the impending Armenian genocide says, apparently there's an extermination of Haitians on the border uh, by Trujillo, 1937. And this, uh, like Neil taking the red pill, takes me into this kind of wormhole that for the next few years, I study this event and everything I could about it. At the same time, me, a son of, you know, like Ayana, son of, the, of Dominican immigrants, migrants to New York City, and trying to find out what my friends growing up always used to say, who were also New Yorkers or Chinese American. They were like, yo, B, how come we're from here, from the Caribbean, and then they point to New York, and we're here? How do we get from there to here, right? And that's been a very diasporic question that has driven me to study one of the most uh, shocking and arguably, uh, you know, what I, I also call the, the largest lynching of Black people in the Americas in the 20th century. And, but it was also about trying to bear witness because at the same time, I'm, there's also documentaries, right? The ascendancy of documenting African-American culture in the 80s and 90s. And so that was a good template for me to, to start questioning or asking questions like, how do you bear witness, right? How do you bear witness to a genocide, to a crime? How do you bear witness to a crime that is genocide when your people are the perpetrators? So all of this for the last few years, Dr. Uthisi's book, uh, One Man Show, Border of Lights Movement, all of this, I'm trying to understand uh, and question my relationship with the DR uh, as an American of Dominican descent, but also bear witness, like these lives, these black lives matter. Um, and, then, and then lastly, I mean, more recently, and also I think Raj touched this uh, upon this, right? You know, one of my favorite kind of call them heroes or theoreticians, one of the most smartest theoreticians in the 20th century was Amical Cabral from Giri Bissau and Cabo Verde. And he has, a, he has, there's a book that I studied in graduate school that is titled, a bunch of his speeches, called Return to the Source. And I feel now at 51 that I'm returning to the source, but the source is not the DR, right? The, the source now is New York City, the tenements, the projects, right? And so 
you know, because as I was, I was growing up, I wanted to find out where I was from. Now I'm trying to turn the prism of bearing witness to very much a diasporic understanding. Uh, I, I didn't grow up in Washington Heights. I grew up in the Lower East Side, very few Dominicans. How did that inform my thinking of what Dominican is? And so what I'm working on now is uh, two things. One is, um, right, where U.S. and Dominican history interject. It's a kind of an archival uh, history. Um, and also getting to this point of what Raj was saying, it's like, you know, may the real African-American, quote unquote, or Caribbean-American stand up. And I just got this thing on, on, on YouTube the other day, and I saw Farrakhan, and I said, his name is like Walcott or something like that. And I'm like, hmm, let me check. And what does Wikipedia say? Caribbean. <laughs> He's Caribbean. Right. So I, I really, I, I really love that. Uh, what Roger's getting it. So I'm trying to understand, uh, you know, when really it's um, moments in where uh, in American history, uh, where the where meets Dominican history. Um, and the other thing is documenting how people in my public housing, because we're the closest to 9-11, how they experienced 9-11. And there are some Dominicans there. So, and I think it's important because when you talk about 9-11, there's, you know, where are the Dominican voices, right? Where are the Chinese American voices, right? My neighbors, you know, the New Yorkians, they're not there. So I'm trying to get to, I think what Raj eloquently talked about, right? And also in part, Ayan and Elizabeth, um, this kind of circum-Caribbean through gender to class to race, but through specific examples of um, the lived experience. And this would mean some archival research at uh, the Public Housing Museum at the LaGuardia Archives in Queens, but also ethnographic research, interviewing my mother, my sister, uh, my neighbors who I remember in 9-11 coming back to the apartments and getting, trying to find a comb or a toothbrush so they could use their DNA to identify a loved one that was missing. So that's where I am now, and uh, I look forward to your questions. Thanks very much, Eddie. Um, the idea was to get some idea of the context for your, you know, why you're doing your research and the real rich depth of, of personal and collective histories. Um, so thanks very much for starting us off. Um, for th those in the audience, do, uh, do write any questions or comments in the Q&A. Um, I'll ask another question to, to our discussants, and then we'll go over to a sort of a group discussion um, with, with the audience. So do scribble any queries you have. We've, we've covered a range of, of um, perspectives and contexts already. I mean, Eddie mentioned the 1980s, and I'll, I'll, I'll drag us forward to the 1990s, where, whereby I think if you wanted to sort of um, get a grip of Dominican and to some, and to some extent Haitian history, you could go to a Trin Trinitaria um, bookshop in Santo Domingo, where not only could you see most of the tomes of historical studies written, but also over a course of a PhD, you could probably read them all. Um, and there's been a, a, a fantastic and bountiful, if you say, increase, explosion, uh, fruition of uh, historical studies about the island and the societies over the last decade or so. And that's why, you know, we've invited these discussions here because they are very much part and parcel of that sort of, don't say new wave, but definitely a, a, um, a, an exciting growth in trying in understanding and exploring the island's histories uh, and written or performed histories. So I just will go around the table again or around the screen and just ask you individually, um, where do you see uh, your research going? Um, if you want to add more or where do you think the major challenges or un unexpected, if you will, areas of, uh, of uh, research are going to find us in uh, five years time or over the next decade or so? What, what are the untapped sources of knowledge to discover? So Ayana, um, over to you. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, well, I mean, I think that there's going to be um, an increased amount of, I mean, it's already happening, but an increased amount of scholarship on Michel Rolf Trio. Um, I watched, and uh, maybe some of you all, actually, we didn't talk about this, but uh, the new, um, series on HBO Max, Exterminate the Brutes. Um, I really love that work because it connects 
um, the story of, I mean, we all kind of in some way have touched upon the personal um, and, um, you know, directors typically kind of hide behind the camera and it takes a lot to do your family history and to think like critically about your story. Um, I don't shy away in, in expressing like the times where it gets overwhelming. Um, um, something I've become more acclimated to. Um, but I think I, I really like, I want to get to the point where every like scholar knows Michelle Rothschild's name. <laughs> like, I just think he's so like silencing the past is the work that I come to over and over and over again. And every time I'm like, whoa, whoa, you know? Um, and, and I think in terms of thinking about Haitian society, it's, it's going to be the text that needs to be, you know, translated in as many languages as possible. Um, for me, uh, specifically, really highlighting the importance of radio in Haitian society um, and discussing how much, I mean, not just the history of the medium and people have done this scholarship discussing the ways in which it's connected to the US occupation in 1915 and the arrival of shortwave radio and things like that. But um, for me, it's such a critical part of political history. I don't, what I'm fearful of is I don't know what my project is going to do. Like uh, I have things that I need to talk about with respect to posters, with respect to film, with respect to recordings with respect to letters that people are writing to stations and programs. Um, but I think something that I'm specifically really interested in, and this is one thing that I really appreciated when I read um, Paulino's book, um, is thinking about the role of the church, which we're obviously once again seeing with respect to the kidnappings that are taking place in Haiti. Um, the situation is horrific. Um, and, um, but I think it's also important to recognize what the U.S.'s relationship is to the island, um, and, um, the continued traumas that are coming out. And so I'm excited to see, uh, this is actually something that Miriam Chauncey said to me that I thought was so wonderful, um, when we were having a discussion in the pandemic, um, she also mentioned the fact that there's going to be an emergence of scholarship about the ways in which the earthquake impacted scholars in Haiti. Um, and I think because we've all touched upon, once again, this question of the personal as it relates to our work, um, you know, I remember all of the op-eds and the, the articles that were coming out with such rapidity after the earthquake. But for the people that were in the island, um, I think that process of like healing oneself um, before writing um, had to take place. And I think um, Miriam's point is that, and I hope I'm not misconstruing her words, um, but my understanding of the comments is that we will see voices from the island emerge more and more about that experience. Um, but I, I and, and also a, a, a growth of scholarship on feminicide, you know, and really talking about what does it mean that a four-year-old girl in Haiti is, is being strangled and found on the street um, and people are being asked for ransom. And so it, it's not, this is, it's, it's such a, a tragedy and, um, and I think that scholarship on women um, is, is just going to have to continue to increase. Um, there's just so much work to be done. Um, so I'll stop there. 
Thanks. Yeah, thank you very much indeed. I mean, you just go back to what was written two decades ago and then see what's written today and just that amazing sort of transformation of knowledge and, and new avenues. Um, Beth, over to you. Um, well, at first, I want to echo, Ayanna, your, your point about TRIO. Um, it was in my notes that as a thing I wanted to talk about. And I teach silencing the past to my sophomore undergraduates at a historically Black university. And they complain all the way through it because it is theoretically challenging to them. No one has asked them to take this on. And almost to a one after the class, they say, that changed the way I think about history. And, and in general, some of them say that as well. And so, I mean, I encourage others to teach it at that undergraduate, at that entry level, but I also think, you know, it really is an important touchstone in informing our work as it moves forward. And I think there's so much to talk about in terms of new directions and, and where Hispaniola studies goes. And a lot of it has to do with this really incredible growth um, that has happened in the past 20 years. And um, I had the amazing opportunity to kind of write a little bit about that historiography and what has happened, um, at least historically, for the most recent issue of CalFu, which was um, a special issue devoted to the work of Lerza Garcia Pena. Um, and, and so in some ways I could kind of go on and on about that, but I wanted to point to just two very specific places that I think we really need to be paying attention um, and to continue to push. Um, when I first started in graduate school in the early 2000s, I had to bite tooth and nail to be allowed to study the Dominican Republic um, because it was considered marginal, less than important. Um, I was strictly forbidden to do what I had wanted to do, which was to look at both Haiti and the Dominican Republic um, because somehow those li linguistic boundaries or board artificial borders were, were not crossable in a, in a scholarly sense. And I think that that is beginning to change, um, but I don't think it has completely changed. And I think we can really look to the tenure denial of Lerja Garcia Pena at Harvard to see that, you know, it continues to be the case that studying the Dominican Republic Haiti or its diaspora is uh, easily enough discarded as not rigorous in service to a larger racist or misogynist agenda, but nonetheless discussed in that way um, that we must continue to push against that narrative and say that these stories and, and histories and pasts and presents continue to matter um, and that the island as, as April Mays likes to say is the center of the universe, right? And when I was working on that article for CalFu, I came upon at least half a dozen different ways that scholars, um, scholars that we are in conversation with have said that, right? Lodestar, crossroads, umbilical cord, navel, crucible, right? All of these words to indicate how central the island is to colonial and decolonial pasts and presence. And I think we continue, need, continue to need to push against that, right? And, and to say how central these narratives are. And I, and I also think the second is connected to that original um, denial of me being able to do Haiti and the Dominican Republic at the same time, that those sort of scholarly and disciplinary boundaries continue to kind of structure the ways in which we think um, and that we have to continue to push against the these artificial boundaries of nation, of language, of homeland, right? Um, uh, Eddie was talking about how do we get from here to here, right? Those questions of, of movement and, and across these artificial boundaries are really important. We have to continue to expand, to use TRIO, to, to think in the ways that Transnational Hispaniola is thinking um, to do this work of, of, of understanding, right? Recognizing these boundaries and borders as lived realities, but understanding and transcending them in the way in which we frame our own, our own work. Thank you very much, Beth. Um, Raj, over to you. Yeah, thanks, Ayana and Beth. Both of your sort of remarks, like uh, 
so it had me thinking in multiple directions and 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 the the text that in addition to silencing the past um which is again when i read it as a grad student i didn't have the fortune of reading it as an undergrad but i'm sure it would have shaken me in really important ways too but as a grad student it, it's just sort of the mind-blowing nature that he's both talking about the way the haitian revolution gets silenced and historiographical process inherently is a silencing activity, right? So he's not just saying that Haiti gets silenced or the revolution gets silenced, but that even in telling the Haitian revolutionary story, you're gonna get this sort of the, the, the chapter on, on Sans Souci, I think, right? That where there's, there starts, there's within the narrating of the Haitian revolution, there are stories that are gonna fall out. And, and sort of that, that sort of dynamic is not one that says, oh, if we only told the story of Haiti better, um, he's, he's saying, no, the very telling is kind of, and this is sort of, it was like a remarkable and remarkably theoretically rich. Um, and and for, for us in academia, sort of humbling, kind of like, yeah, y'all are going to forget some things. You're going to leave out some stuff because this is the way sort of these, these sort of disciplinary functions, um, archival processes and choices, they, they're just going to happen. And, and that's been, and it's been useful for me to think about that um, in, in, in not trying to reach for, I'm going to fix all these things. And, and I would say that's not exactly what I was thinking in, in any way. But that, that, that what we're going to do is um, perhaps fill some gaps and and then have to think about the ones we're still leaving open. Um, and and one of those sort of this is maybe a segue to talk to your question, David. Because I was trying to say which direction I'm going. That um, in in an essay I, I submitted and and the reviewer it was it was it's it's from a part of the the, the book manuscript I'm working on, um, and it was on a Calife, the, the Dominican carnival figure that sort of has mirrors and echoes in other carnival practices across the Caribbean um, and, and also looks like blackface, right? So it's, it's this really, really sort of vexed carnivalesque figure, right? Um, black people painting themselves black, what do you do with that? And it's not as simple as blackface in a US tradition or even in a teatro, uh, teatro bufo tradition in Cuba, um, but it's also not delinkable from that or dearticulated from that. Um, and so so the, the, the thing that I'm, the, the feedback I got on that essay before I revised submitted was, um, how come you're not situating this in the wider Caribbean? And I was like, God damn, because because in my in my larger book project, the theorists that are coming in are C.L.R. James and Sylvia Winter and Franz Fanon. I meant Stuart Hall, as I mentioned earlier. I'm intentionally drawing from Caribbean theorists who have sort of been uh, sort of these interdisciplinary, amazing scholars that are starting to get a lot more play now in certain ways that are great and in certain ways that might not be as great because they're getting divorced, divorced and delinked from the Caribbean. So studies of Sylvia Winter are forgetting that she's Jamaican in some really sort of problematic ways. Um, and 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 so so thinking about Dominican Republic, Haiti as Caribbean sites. So there's there's like to what Beth was saying. There's, there's a provincializing by sort of a, a top down, well, the Dominican is a small place and the Dominican Haiti can't really do it together because of language. And, 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 and one way to respond to this is to situate it within sort of global histories. And I think that's a very appropriate thing. One part of me is like, I, I also wanna almost like pull it back a little bit to say like, let's look at it within a Caribbean or maybe Atlantic um, frame, which is not, not global. It's like, I don't wanna make that distinction too strong. Um, but to think across, I mean, we again, that's work and it's your current work is thinking across the sort of pan-Caribbean um, and, and things that I think about that I'm like, I wish I could speak Papiamento in Dutch um, because the Dominicans, they're ending up in places like Curacao. Um, and then from there, perhaps ending up in Netherlands. In some cases, it's sex work. And so we have sort of gendered and sex work stuff. But then, and, and there, there are some people writing about this stuff, but it's small numbers. And so that sense of the Pan-Caribbean in terms of the, the when we even choose to do Pan-Caribbean, who are we leaving out? It's almost always the Dutch Caribbean for those of us who are Pan-Caribbeanists, even in spirit and in, in, in sort of principle. Um, uh, and and, and that, that sense of the Dominican Republic and Haiti as uh, sort of broader, net nodes and very central nodes in a, in a in sort of a Caribbean history history and historiography. Um, and in the Haitian context, and, and I'm, I'm really indebted in, in, in strong ways to um, Haitianist scholars like Natalie Leger, I've heard say this in, uh, she teaches at Queens, Queens College um, uh, here, here in New York, and, um, and said, you know, oftentimes um, we invoke Haiti without studying it. So as an example, C.L.R. James is writing the Haitian Revolutionary play. And for many of us, those of us who are interested in C.L.R. James stuff, we're not exactly talking about Haiti. We're talking about the play about the Haitian Revolution that does important work in black diasporic and anti-colonial and, and sort of African decolonial efforts. Um, but, but how to think Haiti back 
into itself and not just sort of being kind of a symbol that gets evoked in, in that in that other trio essay, uh, the odd and the ordinary, right? It gets exceptionalized as both the poorest and the most remarkable without ever sort of engaging with very sort of contemporary and longer historical stuff. And it's, it's um, so, so the two people I, I wanted to mention, sort of Maycheck is, is doing this sort of important cross island stuff and Eller's recent work in We Dream Together is brilliant. Um, and someone whose work I wish was translated into English more, Jean-Marie Théodat, uh, the Haitian cultural geographer um, who writes in Spanish and writes in French, and I'm not sure how much he writes in Creole, um, but his work, again, just thinking about island geographies and the sort of three island geographies, just sort of a, a reorienting how I would think of what the island means as a multi, multi-island space. Anyway, that's, I've talked way too long. Thank you very much indeed, Raj. I mean, yes, a number of people could invite it. It was sort of, it, we could have had, I mean, basically that's what Last from the Haiti and the DR focus well, group does that I know that um, you've all been involved in. So, but yes, there's the number of scholars you're mentioning just the, proves the, the richness and the, um, yeah, all the work that's going on. Eddie, over to you. Yes, uh, wow, great, great, great conversation. Yes, I mean, there's so many scholars you know, like um, she just came out with a book. Uh, help me out. She's at the University of ha- uh, Houston. Rachel, is it Rachel? Rachel Quinn. Rachel Quinn. Rachel Quinn. She's just coming. She's just coming out with a book. She just got tenure. Right. There's Anne Eller. There's Lisa Ramirez. There's right. Beth Manley's here. Lorena Garcia. Kiskeya Lora. April Mays. Brian Thorne. There's so many, and many of them also are female. And that sensibility, right? That a lot of us, you know, kind of heteronormative guys that would have missed, right, or even reproduce. They're getting at that, and I think they are also at the at the in the vanguard of what's what's to study. Um, also, Raj, you know, he's humble; he doesn't want to say. It, but Raj, I want to remind everyone about Raj uh, Raj's collaboration also with Amaury in the Black Scholar. Uh, that's amazing with Sophie Marinas too, uh, another scholar. Uh, those are where I think a lot of the topics can be going. Um, uh, also, Essendom. Uh, has uh, in a Maori again, uh, you can text us later, email us. Uh, he has an, uh, they have entries like five entries, and each entry has 10 to 12 research projects to think about, right? Such as, um, you know, uh, women in the revolution in 65, LGBTQ histories in urban life in Santo Domingo, right? Really things outside the box, pan Caribbean, pan Haitian. Dominican relations through literature, and you have all these writers in the 20th century, originals, um, getting together and conspiring. And so that's that's powerful, right? Again, going to this, I think, yes, we all agree, through Yost's book should, is on everybody's desk, uh, right next to the most recent, you know, volume of the Chicago Manual of Style. Um, the other thing is, um, how do we define scholarship, right? Where does this new scholarship come from? Is it, you know, theses and dissertations? And I think we're in here in a kind of academic setting, but I, obviously I know we agree that the scholarship will come also beyond uh, the traditional confines of academia. And I just thought about recently this guy, he's African-American, he's a professor who um, submitted an album, a rap album, peer-reviewed rap album at the University of Virginia as a professor, right? So the, we need to start thinking also like, how do we intersect, overlap and go beyond while still tethered to this academic setting, which, you know, academia for all these issues, right? It still matters, right? In many ways. Yes, I agree with Ayana, right? Femicide on both sides of the border, right? Uh, which is outstanding, right? You, everyone talks about the Taliban and in Afghanistan. I'm not comparing, but I'm just saying when it comes to um, attacks on the female body, going to Beth's point, right? It's like, huh, uh, what, femicide? Uh, no, I'm going to Punta Cana, right? Uh, right? And here are scholars like Beth say, hello, you know, this has been going on, right? And also giving agency to female voices, which is very important. Um, and uh, new research, for example, um, you know, biographies, Peña Gomez, vice president of the Socialist International, he hung out with Chirac, you know? I would love to see a chapter when Peña Gomez is sitting down. What's the conversation with Chirac, right? In the 70s and the 80s, right? All these French leaders, what are they talking about? What are they eating? What does Peña Gomez order, right? 
do they do a little mangu for him, right? At a French hospitality? Probably not, because the French are like, this is our food and, you know, we are the best. You know, who knows, right? But things like that, that really, you know, get to, you know, these flavors that connect the local and the international. Um, also, in terms of new, new topics, um, I saw a talk years ago by Dr. Samuel Martinez at the University of Connecticut and Bridget Wooding, uh, who works in the DR, about biopolitics and using Foucault to talk about what they were very presciently uh, arguing for that, hey, you're going to see the Dominican state um, enter and become more of a surveillance society, right? The surveillance industrial complex by kind of fencing up and putting all these barbed wires like the U.S. border against Mexico along the U.S.-Haiti border. And that is actually happening in the last few years, right? So how do you talk about race, surveillance, control, citizenship, which will disproportionately affect Haitian migrants uh, and Dominicans of Haitian descent and even Dominicans, non-Haitians, uh, Dominican who are read as Black, right? Uh, and lastly, all these topics have to be in conversation with for, for example, as a professor with our particular academic program, right? And also where the, in conversation with academic publishing, right? Um, I, I have been teaching for nearly 20 years at CUNY in an undergraduate program. I have no doctoral students. I just teach undergraduate students, many transfer students from community college, and, if they be, and, and many want to become law enforcement, right? But it's the first time, like, right? Like Beth and Rod said, right? And Ayana that where they see silence in the past and they, you get provoked. And maybe I get, it's a win when somebody says, you know, I want to do a master's in history rather than, you know, going to law enforcement, right? Plato's allegory of the cave, right? Opening up. Um, but it's also about uh, the exigencies of your department and your school, right? And so for me, because, last 20 seconds, because I teach in an undergraduate program, right? my pedagogy is informed by kids who were just high school seniors a year or two years ago. So part of my, the next book and project about U.S. Dominican history is intentionally focused on high school students, college, but also high school students, right? Because I learned years ago teaching high school that I taught Chino Achebue in high school in a social studies class. And then two years later, I went to college and I used the same book and it worked well. So Part of it is also how do you produce scholarship and share it with uh, not just the graduate level student, but also the high school student. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Eddie, and all of you. Um, um, Eve has asked a question, which I think um, you've, you've discussed, uh, come, you know, you provided some great uh, answers to about the um, recent, recent effort in recent years to globalize Dominican Haitian studies and how specifically we might further encompass Hispaniola as an important site for discussion on slavery, decoloniality, and modernity. Um, so I, I think if uh, I think that's been part of a great discussion, I'm conscious that many people are going to whiz off on the hour. Um, apologies for anyone, um, my complete error in mixing up. Greenwich Mean Time with British Summer Time. So some of you might have clocked in an hour earlier. My sincere apologies for that mess up. Um, I shall be very much on British Summer Time now. Um, I also realise why people put the name of the city now when they do time, but it's London and New York. So thank you all for joining us, um, all the audience. Uh, really, a really, I've had a great time listening, a great discussion. I hope you have as well. Thank you for the chats. I'm really good to recognise all the other range of scholars, current scholars uh, working in, in, in this broad field. So um, finally, I should just say the next uh, Oxford uh, Caribbean, Studies, uh, Caribbean Studies Network seminar is on May the 25th at 2 p.m. London time. And Norval Edwards, Edward will be talking about plotting histories Jamaican fiction and uh, Jamaican meta histories. So do join us then uh, for a focus on Jamaica. But I'd just like to thank, uh, well, thank immensely Ayana, Beth, Raj, and Eddie for taking a busy uh, and enjoy hopefully enjoyable hour out of their day uh, to join us. And um, wish you all well and uh, hope to see you on screen in two weeks' time. But thank you very much for, for all our um, speakers. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, thank you.